We're going to destroy each other, or we're going to make it. Now, this looks like some sort of submerged stadium with something. We might build circular cities in the sea, where the water's about 30, 35 feet deep. Most of the apartment houses will open out into the sea. You can observe marine life and fish swimming by. There'll be no zoos, no sequariums. Everything will be observed in natural conditions. There will be boating, scuba diving, recreation, and universities built in the sea. Uh, these drawings all made by you? Yes. This represents a blueprint of the basic structure of the city and the sea. There are helicopter landing areas on the upper section. There are cranes that travel around the entire upper portion of the structure. The legs are designed to move up and down to support the structure and rest on the seabed. Now, what are these cities in the sea for? Some of them represent hospitals that can be towed off the coast of Africa or India. Instead of sending building materials out there and building a hospital, then shipping the equipment out there, it's much easier to build a floating hospital, tow it off the coast of Africa, use it, and by the time the new hospitals are assembled there, you can then move this to another region, float it to another region. Most of the cities will be constructed in dry docks by automated systems. After it's complete, the flood locks are open and it fills with water. And there are units that look like tugboats that deliver the cities to their site where they'll be located. Some will house as many as a million people. A series of cities in close proximity joined together by transport systems, that is, tunnels either under the water or above the water bridges. This is an aerial view of uh, one of the many variations of cities in the sea. The towers are used for residential occupation. The docks surrounding the cities are used for marine exploration and redevelopment. In other words, to restore the reefs, the damaged reefs. The unit in the center is used for hydroponic gardens, growing of food without soil. Now, many of the cities in the sea will have docking facilities for marine vehicles. And that would be like an underwater bus that would take people around to visit the different areas. You'll be able to get a very good picture of the ocean and how we harness it and use it and preserve it and protect it so that future generations might enjoy the oceans also. This projects above one of the cities under the sea with an observation platform and a landing platform on the upper deck. At the sea level, there'll be a floating dock system that moves with the tide up and down so boats can dock. Then you enter an elevator shaft which goes through an airlock. It takes you to the bottom of the sea or the seabed. The seabed is used for observation of reefs, and marine life, not only do they monitor the reefs, they restore the reefs and change them, rebuild them or redesign them. Someday we'll be able to control the shape, configuration of, of reefs so they can support more marine life. I think humans can add to nature and improve it considerably. What will that mean? It will mean a higher standard of living for all people. When he draws these buildings and designs, he thinks about how they go together, how they're manufactured. Some of the drawings I have seen have gone back about 60 years. 
and they're they're just beginning to talk about some of these things now as being a possibility. You know, in the past, people would say you'd never be able to get to the moon, not in a thousand years, and they'd look up the next day and they're going to the moon. You know, when I first met Jacques 25 years ago, and he would talk to some people about certain certain inventions, they'd say you won't see that not in a thousand years, and. Ten years later, they come out with it on the cover of Popular Science. The whole basis of the technology is to maintain a high standard of living. Technology is not worth anything unless it improves people's lives. Today, people are afraid of science and technology because it's so abusive today in so many ways. But it's not science, and it's not the technology we should be wary of. It's the abuse and the misuse of science. You can take a rocket, and you can shoot it in, into outer space and explore outer space, or you can take it and use it as a bomb and destroy another country. It's really the the inanimate object really is in our hands and what we do with it. Science is really the ability to predict the next most probable. That's what the real meaning of science is, gaining the, the ability to predict the next most probable. When, when we talk about science, we're talking about a method of looking at a situation, a method of evaluation that differs from the opinionated system. If you ask me, I'll tell you. The scientific method has no special connection to truth. It really has a, a better way of looking at things than the earlier systems, which everything was attributed to gods or demons. This is where we get into the, applying the scientific method to society. Yes. Now, this is not in a book yet. The scientific method applied to society is something people don't think about much. But if you want to know where the answers may lie, it is in the application of the methods of science with human concern and environmental concern. The future by design refers to the application of the methods of science, not scientists, the methods of science to the social system. Naturally, even the methods of science undergo change, and as they change, so would the future. If we use the scientific method throughout the world, the probability of war drops to zero. The probability of human suffering disappears. Deprivation, poverty, crime, all those things tend to disappear because there's no basis for it. Jacques spent a lot of time before studying people. He started studying how animals behave and how to change the behavior of animals or predict the behavior of animals. And it came to the conclusion that it's really the environment that changes behavior and enables us to behave the way we do. We're not born with prejudice and bigotry and, and anger and greed. It's really generated and nurtured by the environment that we live in. That's why we feel that unless you change your environment and change the experiences, we'll get the same aberrant behavior within people unless the environment is changed. Any culture in the world today tries to educate people so they'll serve a function in that particular culture. In other words, if you're brought up in a Nazi culture, the flag waving and the swastika are the kind of things they put forth. If you're brought up in a, in a primitive tribe, handling the javelin and the bow and arrow would be the kind of thing that you're exposed to. So people are conditioned to serve the interests of an established culture. Who does that to us? The owners of the institutions, the establishment. So they give us a value system that would support existing structures, whether it be religious, non-religious, industrial, military. When children say, you know, Daddy, what's the greatest country in the world? Of course our country is the greatest country in the world. Which God is the right God, Daddy? Our God. All the other gods are false gods. So picture this. A Roman family taking its kids to see the Christians being fed to the lions. And the kids are watching. Dad, can we come next week to see Christians being fed?